Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar, A Designer's Guide to Silicon Carbide Power, brought to you by Tech Online, Wolf Speed, a Cree company, Arrow, and broadcast by Aspen Core. I'm Chris Keach, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event, and you may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window, and then click the Submit button. Please note that we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left. If we're unable to get to your individual question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. And also at this time, we recommend that you disable your computer's pop-up blockers. This will allow the slides to advance automatically throughout the event. At the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete our feedback form, and your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the red survey button at the bottom of your console. Also, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now, on to the presentation, a designer's guide to silicon carbide power. Discussing today's topic is Guy Moxie, Senior Director of Power Products, Wolfspeed. Guy Moxie has spent his entire career in the power semiconductor industry with various roles in applications, product marketing, and product line management. His career has included employment at International Rectifier, Siliconics, and Fairchild Semiconductor. It's with great pleasure I now turn this special session over to Guy to begin. Guy, take it away. Thank you very much, Chris. And hello and welcome. As Chris just mentioned, Guy Moxie, part of the Wolfspeed Power team. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending this uh, one of four series of webinars around designing with silicon carbide. So it's going to be, we aim to be 45 minutes of uh, your valuable time to be educational and informative. And um, the reason behind the designer's guide to silicon carbide power is that we've, we've seen many webinars recently um, that are around silicon carbide or wide bang gap. And they tend to be very commercial, um, which you can find out details of people's products from looking on their website. You don't necessarily have to log into a webinar. And also, I think we're past the stage where the basics of what, what, what is silicon carbide, everyone has some fundamental feel. So realistically, we wanted to get down to the facts because we've noticed that after many webinars, there are always a series of questions around designing. These questions tend to be um, common questions around gate driving. How do I optimize the system for efficiency, power density, EMI, short circuit? Can I run the MOSFET at 175 degrees C? Common themes of questions. So this prompted us to really put together this series of um, design-related webinars that are going to walk you through a lot of these and answer them um, to your satisfaction. But before we do, I'd like to pass the back to, to, to Chris because we're gonna have a very, very quick poll because this is designing with silicon carbide. The poll is about your status of design. So Chris, do you wanna run the first poll? All right, thank you, Guy. So we have three polling questions for you today. This is the first of three. To participate in our poll, simply click on the radio button next to the answer that's appropriate for you, and then click the Submit button. Our question here for you, uh, have you designed with silicon carbide before? Your answers could be yes, this will be my first design I'm considering, or not yet. And again, just go ahead and click on the radio button next to the answer that's appropriate for you, and then click the Submit button. We'll give you a few moments to go ahead and submit your answers. We encourage your participation. Also, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so at any time by clicking on the Q&A icon, typing your question in, and then we'll get to those during our Q&A session coming up at the end of the program. So let's give you just a moment here more to input your selection, and then we'll take a look at those results. All right. Thank let's you take very a look much. Now, Chris. at what we have, and we have 33% uh, said yes, 15% said it'll be my first design, 18.2 said I'm considering, and not yet was about 33 as well. So, Guy, your thoughts on the results? 
Yeah, that's a very interesting set of results. It's nice to see a third of people have designed with silicon carbide before, which shows the maturity and uh, how this technology is getting entrenched in the market. And obviously, this, uh, these series of webinars are going to be around the second, third, and fourth um, poll of answers to help people along the way to remove those barriers. So thank you very much. An interesting set of results. So what are we actually going to get stuck into over the next 45 minutes? Very briefly, we're just going to re, uh, reintroduce and, and get us all aligned on the silicon carbide landscape and why people are working with silicon carbide. Then we're going to walk into losses. Uh, losses obviously fall into two categories, which are conduction loss and switching loss. We're going to address both of those. And then that, that ties us nicely into switching frequency, which is one of the many, many um, common questions we have. What is the optimum switching frequency for silicon carbide? Tied very closely into switching frequency is, of course, device, circuit, system inductance. Following on from that, we're going to walk into gate driving and optimizing gate drivers around silicon carbide and layout and gate drive considerations. Then we're going to go into EMI. We're going to talk a little bit about EMI today. We're going to have a further webinar later on dedicated to modeling in EMI to go into much more detail, but uh, we're certainly going to give it some air time today. And then we're going to wrap up showing you real life examples of applications enabled by silicon carbide. So I think we're all here looking at silicon carbide because of what potential it does bring. And this is, of course, higher switching frequency without compromise of efficiency. So higher switching frequency, lower switching loss, lower output, output capacitance on a lot, of the, a lot of the devices that obviously help your, your resonant DC to DC type of soft switching, zero voltage, less temperature um, dependence on resistance or on resistance, RDS on, which of course is I squared R loss. And, and what does this all achieve? Why are we actually doing it? Is increasing the power density, reducing size and weight of the systems, and balancing, of course, system costs. That's why we all look to silicon carbide to what it can offer. Just looking at the landscape, though, because recently um, silicon carbide has introduced its 650 volt product portfolio. Wolfspeed introduced our 650 volt um, two months ago now. With this, it really does broaden up what traditionally we saw as the semiconductor market. Before 650 volt in silicon carbide, silicon carbide was well known for 900 to 1200, 1700 volt, higher power, high switching frequency. But now with 650, it really takes a big bite out of the, uh, the, the lower power area, which traditionally was silicon whether it was superjunction MOSFETs or IGBTs, and the other wideband gap technology of GAN. So you can see from the graph showing performance criteria, many different criteria, to be honest, all bracketed together on the y-axis against the voltage. And now with silicon carbide, the purple, the purple side, we can actually see how it uh, really does encroach into a much larger section of the landscape usable, introducing the same value proposition of performance. And just to restate as well, this is not for tomorrow. This is not a technology that will become into the market, will be used. This is a technology that's here today. It's mature and it's proven. Some of the biggest barriers to adoption on maturity, supply, reliability. That, is all, that has all been completely and utterly accepted. So what we're showing here is what you see today enabled by silicon carbide, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's through EV battery charging for cars, for buses, for industrial type vehicles, obviously for solar power. It's been entrenched in solar power, server farms, cloud computing co farms for many, many, many years. And then now with the, uh, the larger die sizes in the market, we can see very much it's been brought into the higher power area, for example, trains, traction, that sort of type of application. So it's really enabled these markets. People are designing very strongly and heavily with silicon carbide today. From a wall speed side, of course, why can we enable these? 
is a large, mature, entrenched product portfolio, ranging from watts through to megawatts. 600 volt, 650 volt, 900 volt, 1200 volt. In development, going above 1200 to 17, and then breaching out into the 3.3, 6 and a half, and 10 kV. From two amps through to hundreds of amps. So this gives a wide portfolio to design with. Product is out there not just one or two MOSFETs anymore and a handful of diodes. There are significant product portfolios out there to choose and optimize with. So really, let's start focusing down on the details. Fundamentals, folks, real fundamentals here. RDS on. Now, I know this sounds so basic, but it's amazing how many times this gets overlooked. RDS on over temperature. So we are so used, predisposed to look at RDS on, of course, at a data sheet at 25C. Nobody uses a part at 25C. So when you look at the different technologies available, track it out. Look at the normalized curve going out to your optimized temperature, junction temperature, typically 120 to 140 C. Silicon carbide is rated to 175. So obviously you have a few degrees higher usage, but please look at the data sheet because what you're going to find is that huge difference in RDS on over temperature against the different technologies. You can see from this graph silicon, you can see silicon carbide, and you can see GAN. Silicon and GAN both increase roughly 2 to 3x over temperature. So I squared R, 3x over temperature. Silicon carbide, and this obviously is showing wall speed silicon carbide, typically increases 1.3 to 1.4x over temperature. That is a considerable difference. So when you pick out a data sheet and it says 60 milliohm for silicon or GAN, it's probably going to be 120 to 150 milliohms hot. If you pick out a 60 milliohm data sheet from wolf speed silicon carbide, it's going to be 90 milliohms hot. If you pick out a 90 milliohm data sheet, it's going to be 120 milliohms hot. So basics, basics, please check the data sheets thoroughly. It's amazing how much this gets overlooked. So you specify I squared R of the correct device. Otherwise, you're overrating the device that's going to cost a lot more. Okay, next question on against the cut that conditioning loss again, but this time in IGBT. Why does silicon carbide MOSFETs win through IGBT? We don't have a knee voltage. IGBTs, of course, are optimized for full, full thermal design point. So you're optimizing for full current, full rating. And then below that, you have this exponential VCE SAT knee voltage curve, where, of course, a MOSFET is a linear line. So at 100% rating, both losses are matched. But then 99% and lower, the MOSFET has a lower conduction loss or the equivalent conduction loss. This is why we see examples like EV drivetrains, which are battery powered. And also the drive cycle is pretty much mostly below full rated power. And this is where that uh, linear VDS curve of the MOSFET absolutely shines through versus the knee exponential curve of the IGBT. Put devices in parallel, and of course it's the, the problem becomes even worse for an IGBT because you have that fixed VCE, VCE curve. So again, conduction loss. RDS on against temperature and the lack of knee voltage is basics, but they really need to be taken into effect as we walk through the design cycle. Moving to switching loss, this is a very interesting topic. I dug out some uh, textbook numbers on switching loss. What is the effective switching frequency? This is a fairly standard formula taking a, from a data sheet, taking IC rated using a 50% duty cycle, so hard switched, okay, and working what is the effective switching frequency without violating any data sheet specifications. 
shown in the graph, um, in the chart, sorry, are a handful of wolf speed MOSFETs using the ESF, which is power dissipation max minus one minus duty cycle over total switching energy. Again, take it at data sheet values using RG data sheet. And you can see the theoretical hard switched effective switching frequency ranging from 750 kilohertz down as the, the RDS on lowers to 144 kilohertz. Now just comparing like for like as again a theoretical example. A 40 milliohm silicon carbide MOSFET versus a 40 milliohm silicon MOSFET. You can see there's a 10x difference in effective switching frequency. Now, this is theoretical for hard switched, but it gives you a feel of capability. This is the benchmark we're working for. But in reality, what really does limit switching frequency? We know the device capability extends to, to very high frequency, but practicality really does come in. So this is a chart we put together comparing MOS, silicon carbide MOSFETs versus IGBT. And realistically, let's be practical, cooling, magnetics and cost affect switching frequency. Cooling costs are one of the most considerable portions of it. We show here frequency on the x-axis and the relative dollars on the y-axis. You look at IGBT and you can see the cooling costs obviously increase as you would expect as switching frequency increases. And then you look at the, um, the bomb savings against the magnetics which are, of course are the inductors, the, the transformers, the capacitors. And you can see that IGBT really comes in the optimum switching frequency where cooling versus bomb savings intersect is just under 20 kilohertz. This is well known. Obviously you can increase the cooling and increase the switching frequency. And of course, there is a finite amount of uh, reduction you can have in the inductors. If you are, for example, grid tied, then you, you can't get away with minimizing the inductors completely because you're tied to the grid. The grid is gonna win. So there is a certain amount of inductance you have to have on those input filters. But you can see the intersection line for IGBT is around about 18 kilohertz. Let's move to a silicon carbide MOSFET. You look at the, uh, the cooling costs, obviously increase as switching frequency increases. Lower loss, yes, but it's still, still creating loss and it's still got to be dissipated. And then the bomb savings, you can see for hard switching, Really, the, uh, the sweet spot is around the 60 kilohertz range. So that corresponds, when you look at some of our reference designs and our evaluation kits, the totem pole uh, design, for example, switches at 67 kilohertz. Solar boost, two-channel boost for a string inverter switches at 48. You can see that sort of zone for silicon carbide and the intersection between cooling costs and bomb savings. But when you compare the two, there's roughly a 20 to 25% improvement by implementing silicon carbide in the system. So this brings us back to the question of system costs. Yes, generally speaking, the silicon carbide product will be a little bit more expensive than a silicon product. But when you look at the overall system saving by optimizing that switching frequency, then the system level savings typically are improved with silicon by implementing silicon carbide. Of course, EMI is a consideration. You can switch a lot faster as we've proven with silicon carbide. But EMI is a consideration and we'll go into that a little bit later on. So, just summarizing very quickly between losses of conduction losses and switching losses, when you look at a design, what is going to be your main consideration? So, Chris, are we ready for the next poll? Absolutely, Guy. This is our second poll uh, of the evening uh, or of the day, I should say. Uh, looking at system costs, what are the primary factors in your design? Is it magnetics? Is it semiconductors? Or is it cooling? And just go ahead and click on the radio button next to the answer that's appropriate for you. And then click the submit button again. Looking at system costs, what are the primary factors in your design? Magnetics, semiconductors, or cooling? 
and we'll give you a few moments to go ahead and input your answers. We encourage your participation. Also, if you'd like to ask a question, now's a great time to do it. Type your question into the Q&A text area and then click the submit button. We'll get to as many of those as we can uh, after the program uh, has wrapped up as far as uh, the presentation. So we'll give you just a moment here and we'll take a look at our results. So it looks like 26% said magnetics, semiconductors 46%, cooling 27%. Guy, your thoughts on uh, the results of our second poll? Yeah, that exact, thank you. That exactly ties in with what we were discussing. Magnetics and cooling balance each, each, each other out with the semiconductor content. Of course, that's going to uh, increase as the power level increases. If it's a 5-watt power supply, the semiconductor content is going to be minimal. But as this is silicon carbide we're talking about today, typically we're going to be looking at something 2 kilowatt to 200 kilowatts. So the semiconductor content would naturally shine through. But I'm hoping that uh, we've all seen that the uh, the magnetics and the cooling can be optimized by using the silicon carbide content. This is just another example showing the, the impact of switching loss. Again, reference to an IGBT, and it just shows that uh, hard switched half bridge. And this is a double pulse test we did like for like and it shows typically 83 percent lower loss when you look at that reverse recovery of the pin diode which is co-packaged with the igbt you're seeing a uh, sort of 144 nanosecond recovery time versus silicon carbide with 29 nanoseconds and look at the ringing look at the overshoots we we drastically cut down that uh, loss but we don't introduce significant ringing, which of course is an EMI concern, which we'll cover later on. Another very important aspect about optimizing figure of merit. That's a great, great phrase, figure of merit. RDS on times switching loss, or QG typically. But when we look at um, some data sheet products, You've got to really look very carefully because this is a great example from our module team, which is the XM3 modules that we've recently released. Very, very, I think the, the highest power density modules in the industry. We have a four, 450 amp module versus a 400 amp module. Now this is hot at 150 degrees C. And you can see there's an inflection point around about, again, 18 kilohertz between the two modules, one being lower current, one being slightly higher current. But what you can see, the 450 amp CAB 450 amp module in the blue is uh, optimized around a very, very uh, low RDS on, low, con um, low I squared R die whereas the CAB400 module is optimized for figure of merit, so it has a different die inside. And you can see as the switching frequency increases, both the ampacity, which is the left-hand graph, or the power output, which is the right-hand graph, you can see around about that sort of 15, 18 kilohertz, what would be a lower current-rated module on a data sheet actually carries more power and current than its, uh, than its colleague as the switching frequency increases. Now, for a motor drive, typically you're operating under, under 20 kilohertz. So that's why what, uh, the conduction loss is critical. But then if you're moving to more of a static power type of application as a DC to DC or, a, or even a DC to AC uh, inverter for say a solar, solar application, then you could be ranging up to 40, 48 to 60 kilohertz operation, as we discussed. Then, obviously, what would be a lower power module on a data sheet becomes actually more effective. So, again, please look at figure of merit when you look at your designs. Now, implementing switching frequency. This is a very, very good part of the consideration. What we have today, this shows a, a great example of um, shows a great example of a real system. I do apologize; something seems to be jumping forward on the slides. It shows a real system when we look at the magnetics. This is a, a direct impact of switching frequency. This is a 200 kilowatt UPS system that we've worked through and modeled. IGBT-based system working at 16 kilohertz. Again, 
when we showed the uh, effective switching frequencies and the optimum switching frequencies of silicon, we came to 16 to 18 to 20 kilohertz. So as you would expect, IGBT operating at 16 kilohertz. Moving to silicon carbide, we optimize now for higher switching frequency without compromise of loss. In actual fact, with improving losses, 48 kilohertz. What effect does this really have? Of course, cooling huge there's a significant difference in losses igbt at 16 kilohertz is just under 400 watts of loss silicon carbide at 48 kilohertz is just over 200 watts incidentally if you could operate igbt at 48 kilohertz successfully you're going to be dissipating nearly 900 watts but the effect of this, of course, is on the size of your magnetics. We discussed about the reduction in magnetic cost and size. This is a real example. The inductor here goes from 1.2 millihenries for IGBT to 0.4 for silicon carbide. This is roughly a 2.5x reduction in cost. Now, obviously, we don't manufacture inductors, so the actual cost can be debated. But taking relative values from what we see in the market, the, the IGBT inductor is 2.5x the cost. And, of course, that's a considerable difference in weight and size and loss. This is the effect of optimizing switching frequencies. Yes, we could go higher in switching frequency, but I will say practical considerations come in that uh, if you do, especially at 20 kilohertz, um, 20 kilowatts, if you do go much higher in, uh, in inductors, in frequency, you get to exotic materials, which of course then negates the, the cost saving because you pay a lot more for the exotic materials or inductors. So we wanted to show you this because this is a good dose of practicality. Finally, just summarizing like for likes, what are the advantages of silicon carbide? The top charts show devices in parallel. These are two random devices in parallel. We took, these weren't binned. These were just taken directly from actual, in fact, we bought them from catalog to make them this as neutral as possible. And it shows two devices operating parallel, how nicely they share. PTC um, characteristics of the devices mean ensuring pleasant current sharing. Lower RGs, um, internal RGs help the dynamic current sharing, and obviously threshold is inversely related to temperature to help balance the power dissipation. A couple of other small things to point out, just again to help your design considerations. Ruggedness, VDS ruggedness, voltage breakdown. Silicon's been around for a very, very long time. This is the lower left graph. And a typical IGBT are rated at 1200 volts, will probably roll over about 1250 volts. Silicon carbide, because it has to be more robust and more rugged, would typically be rated actually a lot higher. Data sheet will say 1200 volts, but breakdown, as you can see, will be quite a few hundred volts higher. Now, we don't obviously uh, support violating any data sheet parameters. But this comes into a big effect when you have to derate. If you look at something like cosmic radiation, um, terrestrial neutron uh, effects, then obviously you have to derate as altitude increases. This is where the robustness of VDS, of silicon carbide, really shines through. And finally, we've talked about this a little bit before, but this should just shows what a huge impact reverse recovery has for a silicon carbide diode. This shows you here body diode, this one, this is not a separate shot key in parallel. The right-hand chart shows a 650 volt silicon carbide versus a 650 volt silicon MOSFET. And basically the QRR of the silicon MOSFET body diode, 13,000 nanocoulombs. This is actually measured versus 11 of the silicon carbide MOSFET. So less than 1% of the QRR. So when not so important, obviously, when you're soft switching, or when you're asymmetrical, but if you're symmetrical, bucks, boosts, or half bridges, hard switching, that reverse recovery of the MOSFET is critical. Totem pole PFC, for example.
Moving on to, again, some fundamentals, folks, but so simple that it often gets overlooked. Kelvin source. You see it in silicon from time to time. It's critical in silicon carbide. Three pin versus four pin. Very, very straightforward. Basically, the three pin has been around for a long time, drain gate source. And, of course, with the four pin, it introduces a Kelvin source, so it eliminates that source inductance out of the three pin. That source inductance basically pushes back against the gate driver. When it's implemented, it adds to the CISS, of course, and that slows down the switching loss. You can see there the typical switching loss of a three pin device versus just simply taking the same die but putting it in a four pin package and implementing it into the system. You get a huge reduction in switching loss just by implementing a four pin package. Do not overlook that fact. This just shows the total energy very clearly. The TO247 package, okay, same RG. Internal and external and internal RG, the same die using these devices. You see that the TO247 3 lead has nearly 450 microjoules of uh, total switching loss. If you literally take the same product but in a 4 lead package, K package we call it, it has basically 200, just 150 uh, microjoules of loss. Obviously, moving to something like a surface mount with more pins, a D2 Pack 7 lead would be even better. So please do not overlook some of the very, very simple basics. Moving on to gate drive, and this just shows how we can do a like-for-like -like comparison. This is taking, sorry, this automatically keeps jumping without me touching it. I do apologize looking at a side-to-side -side comparison of looking at conduction loss and switching loss. What we're doing here is showing a DC to DC is 400, roughly 400 in, 48 volts out. So this is a typical server type of application. And this is taking silicon versus silicon carbide. And again, remember the idea is on over temperature. What we're doing here is showing that a 120 milliohm silicon carbide device stacking up against of roughly a 60 milliohm superjunction device in a DC to DC application. You can see here efficiencies are very tightly grouped together. There's no compromise in uh, in efficiency. It's all within 0.2%. You also see case temperatures are running plus or minus 100%, slightly cooler for one of the superjunctions, silicon carbides in the middle. Just as a point of note, by the way, folks, when you do shine a camera to measure temperature on top of a, a package, a typical discrete package, and you get a case temperature, the junction temperature is going to be anywhere from 10 to uh, 10 to 20 degrees higher. But the, the message from this slide, again, with the RDS on over temperature, we are implementing a 120 milliohm device versus a 58 or a 57 milliohm silicon device. And just by the way, as a reference, if you look at catalog pricing, that silicon carbide device, which is of equal performance, is coming in at the lowest cost, just from a catalog price. So price, position, and performance. Moving on to gate driving. Big question, and again, we're going to follow on on a dedicated webinar with gate driving later on. But... Nothing really different from silicon, whether it's a MOSFET or IGBTs. You've got to put a positive gate drive on, of course, to turn it on, and with silicon carbide, a negative gate drive to ensure hard turn off. Outside of that, yes, you've got to look at uh, DV by DT, those rising edges and falling edges, because they are faster than silicon. So you've got to have a device that can drive that. You've got to look at working insulation voltage, but you would have to anyway with silicon. Drive capability. These are obviously generally higher power, so you've got to look at the appropriate source and sink. Propagation delays. Miller clamp. Important aspect because in hard switch, you've got to avoid that shoot through. Same as you would do in silicon. Obviously, with uh, silicon carbide, the thresholds tend to be a little bit lower, 2 volts. So there's a little bit more of a consideration. And, of course, short circuit protection 
is another consideration. And we'll cover protection in a later webinar. But silicon carbide, being a smaller die size, does have less of a short circuit rating than, I, than the equivalent IGBT. However, there are gate drivers, many a gate driver on the market today that can safely operate between under two nanoseconds of short circuit protection. So it gives plenty of safety headroom there. But otherwise, from a design point of view, it's the same as what you do with silicon. Gate driver net as close as you possibly can to the market. Switching speed to limit dV by dt. Typically, silicon carbide can work between, if you wanted to, 50 to 100 um, volts per nanosecond. But that's obviously pretty fast, rising edges and falling edges. Minimize gate loop inductance, capacitors between gate and source. Common principles you would implement for silicon, you implement exactly with silicon carbide. Just looking at the gate waveform of silicon carbide, you can see very clearly on the data sheets, we all specify operating and we all specify maximum. And it's transient conditions for maximum, and then obviously steady state DC for operating. Wolf Speed Products operates 15 to minus 4 operating, 18 to minus 8 um, with transient conditions. Layout for gate drive. Again, don't be afraid of anything here. It's nothing you haven't encountered with silicon. Sorry, someone's asking, they're going to have to probably keep controlling my uh, slide deck because it's automatically moving through from the system. But the layout is exactly what you would implement for the system. You've got to be symmetrical on board level. You've got to be symmetrical. Keep it balanced. This is an example showing two devices in parallel. So this is a half bridge, two switches in, uh, for a high side, two switches for low side. Keep the symmetrical gate path. Add the parallel devices. Some stray inductance leading to each device for better current dynamic sharing and then down to the joining mode. Underneath have the second layer path of return, lowers and counterbalances the inductance. Standard principles, nothing to be afraid of. From a system level, again, looking at a system, standard design practices. This is a three-phase system, ceramic caps next to the drain, of the MOSFETs, source on the bottom, reducing the inductance, followed very closely by the film claps. Snubbering across the DC bus to absorb the ringing. This is standard practice. Symmetrical phase balancing between A, B, and C. Con control signals coming off and on in a symmetrical way, plugging through the board. Optimum copper area for switching noise, reducing radiated EMI. Nothing out of the ordinary, folks. The time for our final poll. And Chris, I'll pass across to you. All right, thank you, Guy. Uh, this is our third and final poll here. Uh, this one says, what driver is your, uh, what is your top concern when selecting a gate driver? Is it DVDT, is it negative voltage, or is it short circuit protection? And here, you just, again, select the radio button next to the answer that's appropriate for you. Click the submit button. This is our final polling question, and we would like your participation in this one. We'll be moving on to the Q&A here shortly, so now is an ideal time to go ahead and submit your questions. We'll get to as many of those as we can in the time we have left at the end of today's program. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. And again, our question, what is your top concern when selecting a gate driver, DVDT, uh, negative voltage, or short circuit protection? And we'll take a look at those results here momentarily. And it looks like 47% said DVDT, negative voltage was 17, and 35% said short circuit protection. So, Guy, your thoughts on our final polling question? Thanks, Chris. That's exactly what we would have expected. DV by DT because of the, the, the fast capability of silicon carbide. Negative voltage, yes, you have to create it. It does cause a concern, but very popular with IGBT anyway. And short circuit protection, I briefly discussed it earlier. Yes, it is an Achilles heel of all silicon carbide, but thankfully our gate drive colleagues have brought out technologies that can uh, solve that problem. So good answers. Just to uh, move on to the, the, 
the latter section of the gate drive and the layout, inductance, how this really rolls into um, the, the whole system design. We showed you some gate drive designs, we showed you some board designs, now we're showing you some system level designs. We spent a huge amount of time on our modules reducing internal strain inductance. The XM3 series is 6.5 nanohenries. If you don't lay that whole system out correctly, that is a complete and utter underutilization of the module. Symmetrical designs, flattened buzz bars along the, uh, the DC side, positive and negative, self-canceling effects. Because if you do not pay particular attention to the buzz bar design, you're going to end up with a whole system that could be 50 or 60 nanohenries of stray inductance bearing in mind the module six. A tight design, for example, we show here, can lead to roughly probably 12 to 15 nanohenries of total system inductance. Then you can utilize that low inductance of the module. The, lo higher, the higher the inductance, the higher ringing you're gonna get. Cold plate, capacitor, DC link, buzz barring, output center, all symmetrical design. This is a particular example shown in our CRD um, evaluation kit, but keep that in mind when you're laying out the design. Final ones just to finish off with, and we'll have, we will have a dedicated uh, seminar on EMI, but let's just, take, let's just spare some slides. Don't panic about EMI. People have shown they're considering and think about DV by DT, which they should do, which is obviously those rising edges and falling edges, but don't panic. What you do see, of course, you're going to see a sharper DV by DT, both rising and falling from silicon carbide. That's the way you reduce the switching loss. But the effect is not as problematic as you would think. If you look at the uh, left-hand curve, you will see the differences in silic between silicon and silicon carbide. Look at the right-hand curve. It only really comes into effect when you get to higher switching frequencies. And still, you mitigate this by standard EMI practices. What I will show you is an example. Let's take it out from theory into practicality. We actually retrofitted. We bought a standard off-the-shelf power supply. It's a DIN rail power supply. Very, very noise sensitive application, DINRAIL. It's uh, offline in, 48 volts out, 5, 480 watts. We literally retrofitted the supply, taking silicon superjunction out and putting in silicon carbide. And you can see from this slide, let's look at DV by DTs. You can see it turn on. Silicon was 21 nanoseconds of, of TF with 15.6 volts per nanosecond dV by dt. Looking at silicon carbide at turn on, TF, so we're roughly slightly less than half on the TF, and yes, going from 15 to 24 volts per nanosecond on the dV by dt, so yes, you are getting a sharper, crisper edge. On the turn off, as you would expect, similar story. Silicon, very slow turn off, 135 nanoseconds, a mere five volts per nanosecond. Silicon carbide, and this is using recommended data sheet values, 55 nanoseconds, seven volts per nanosecond. But what does this actually give us? We measured the spectrum, conductive EMI. Superjunction is on the left-hand side, silicon carbide is on the right-hand side. You can see both specs, EN6100,000 specs, which are the limits, and you can see realistically no visual difference between the two different technologies in that system working exactly the same way. There was no difference seen in conducted EMI, despite the slight difference in DV by DT. So again, nothing to be too panicked about. Yes, you start do you do start migrating when you get to much higher frequencies, as shown in this slide. But it really only comes into effect, and the most noticeable difference comes into effect at 40 megahertz. And again, usual mitigation practices can occur. Just as reference, the left-hand chart does show differences in our rise time. We have three different rise times there shown, and it only really started to make an effect at five, 
3 to 4 megahertz, 5 megahertz, and that is a very, very small difference. So change, really changing the rise times and optimizing RG still does not have a massive effect on the EMI. So really with EMI, and again, we'll go into a dedicated webinar, but don't panic, it's all okay. Silicon carbide does enable switching frequencies much higher than silicon and without the compromises of loss and has higher dv by dt but this has little effect that we've seen on normal design frequencies emi filtering same method same mitigations so just wrapping up and i do apologize for the slides dancing around somewhat it was out of my control but you will be able to download lists afterwards and get them all in the correct order and in much more detail i please encourage you to do that because what you will see as you embark on your design uh, projects, you will see that silicon carbide really does make a difference and is being used today. This is not just us showing these designs. These are real application people's systems. This ranges again from watts to megawatts. We show in the left-hand side 10 kilowatt solar inverter, how the difference between IGBT and silicon carbide the bottom left hand side is an EV drivetrain showing 120 kilowatt IGBT versus 180 kilowatt silicon carbide. Look at the difference in power density there. Let's go down to down power showing on the right hand side a 220 watt LED power supply, little switch mode power supply flyback showing the difference in power density between silicon and silicon carbide. And then the bottom left, we have two. We have the 200 kilowatt UPS example I showed you earlier on, on the magnetics. This is the cooling and the module um, effect. And the final bottom right, very interesting design. It's a DC to DC section of a, of a off-board EV charger. The left-hand picture is the uh, a 15 kilowatt DC to DC stage using silicon. The other side of the... Uh, phone is a 20 kilowatt dc to dc stage using silicon carbide and you can see just from those quick glancing at all of those pictures the difference in power density without compromise of efficiency and without compromise of system cost tools where can you start it start really getting stuck into this we do quantify all of what I've said, and it's been very briefly 45 minutes of covering a lot of ground, but on the WolfSpeed website, we have demo kits, we have hardware designs, we have digital designs, we have evaluation kits, and we have simulation. Please go on to our website. There is a wealth of supporting applications, tools, and designs. Finally, just one big commercial plug for WolfSpeed. Obviously, I've been talking gen generally about the advantages of silicon carbide, but hey, we, uh, we've been doing silicon carbide for nearly 40 years now. We're investing a huge amount of money because this market is exploding and people want guaranteed supply of capacity. And of course, we have longevity and maturity. So we want to be your key partner in enabling these designs for silicon carbide. And just to wrap up, again, this was a brief overview of designing with silicon carbide for this first webinar, but we are hosting three more, which are going to go in much more depth. July, we'll be modeling with Wolfspeed SICK. So this is not just uh, spice and power dissipation, but this will be EMI modeling as well. So July is modeling in EMI. August is gate driving designs going into a deep, di deep dive on gate driving. And then September will be the final one, which will obviously be applications enable, enabled by Wolfspeed 6. So I'll go into much more detail of those applications I briefly, briefly showed you. So finally, thank you very much. It's been a, a very quick 49 minutes to be precise. Key takeaways being that yes, silicon carbide is here today and it is being used. And it's not so difficult to use as people may think. We are here to help knock down the barriers because you do achieve higher efficiency, power density, and system cost than silicon. We are here to prove and help that quantification all along the way with our tools, with our support. And Wolfspeed does bring the most experience to this game in not only making silicon carbide, but producing it and using it. So with that, I would like to pass back to Chris for questions. 
All right. Well, thank you, Guy. As a reminder, please fill out the feedback form that will open up at the end of the show. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in our Q&A session, just type your question into the into the text area where the Q&A icon is, or uh, click on the text box and type your question in. Once you're done with that, uh, click Submit, and we will get to as many of those questions as we can. If we don't get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. So, Guy, we've got a lot of questions coming in here for you. Our first one says, uh, do you recommend any gate drivers for uh, silicon carbide parts? Yes, we absolutely do. We don't produce gate drivers ourselves, so we have the luxury of partnering with the best gate driver suppliers in the industry. Um, we have comprehensively evaluated all of their products because in the past, a lot of products have been around IGBTs and they've been modified to, uh, to, to work with silicon carbide. Now, you've just listened to me bang on for 49 minutes about optimization. So there are now products out there from Gate Drive partners that we were publishing on our website. We're not approving them, but we have evaluated them. They satisfy some of the problems we talked about with Gate Driving, uh, source and sync capability, DV by DT, sensing, short circuit, and they solve those problems. So yes, please go to our website and our channel partner website because we do show a lot of interoperability with uh, supplies with gate drive products. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question here, uh, is there any uh, LT SPICE model uh, of your components available? Absolutely there is, of course there is. Yes, it's on our website, please go to our website. You do have to give your name and email address just to uh, get access to them, but we do supply LT SPICE with all of our products. All right, thank you, Guy. Uh, and can I apply uh, lower and higher voltages to gate to the gate without compromising the device? You can, um, like you would do with any MOSFET. It's a fairly same common principles. We do recommend um, minus four to be completely safely turned off. However, a lot of our reference designs, especially in soft switch, do operate very safely at zero volts. And then we absolutely recommend 15 volts to be fully enhanced. And we do show a lot of documentation if you reduce the volts uh, down from there. But please, as any normal MOSFET, you've got to make sure it's fully turned off and fully enhanced. All right. Thank you, Guy. Uh, another question asks, can a packaged uh, silicon uh, carbide MOSFET uh, operate at 175C as well? Are, and are packages still limiting the operating temperature of sick FET? Yes, the data sheet clearly says the max operating temperature, which is 175. Now, I think the question was, can the package be at 175? So if you shined a thermal camera on the package itself and it said 175 degrees C, then as I mentioned, the die actually inside the junction temperature of the die could be 10 or 15 degrees C higher. What tends to limit, and this is the same with, um, with silicon as well, what tends to limit discrete devices is the mold compound of the packages. Silicon carbide dye can operate quite a bit higher, but the mold compound tends to limit the junction and the operating usage of that device. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question here asks, what can you say about the 200 kilohertz in soft switching PFC? The 200 kilohertz soft switch PFC, I'm not sure quite what that question is. Most of our, all of our PFCs are actually hard switched. We have a totem pole at 2 kilowatts, which is 67 kilohertz. We have an, a 20 kilowatt and a, to a 50 kilowatt active front end, which is at 48 kilohertz. I think the question might have been around the DC to DC stage, which of course is uh, LLC or phase shift, so it's soft switched. Typically, we see a silicon uh, multi-level DC to DC operating around about 100 kilohertz. We operate at least twice that, and our reference designs show, for example, 200 kilohertz soft switch. I think that's probably more the question that was answered, was asked. All right. Thank you, Guy. Another question says, please define the effective switching frequency again. 
Uh, and uh, thank you in advance. Uh, let me uh, just run back to that slide. Yeah, this was taken actually out of a textbook because it was a, a, a neat way to really look at it. It's basically um, the maximum switching frequency in a hard switched application. So again, hard switched, the device can sustain at, uh, at, high, at IC100, which is rated amps with a 50 degrees C square wave duty cycle. So a symmetrical on high side, off low side, on high side, lo off low side, without exceeding data sheet values. And the formula is there when you look back. Please download the presentation because you'll see the formula. It's fairly, fairly easy to follow. And again, this is theoretical. Doesn't take into effect costs, cooling, or EMI. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question asking, can you please recommend uh, some software which would be good at simulating uh, silicon carbide devices? Absolutely, I can. Obviously, there was a question earlier on about uh, LT Spice, the predecessor being P Spice, but we use LT Spice. That's all on our website. In addition, we have a, a power simulator called SpeedFit. This, again, you have to uh, donate your email address to, to get access to, but it is an excellent um, power simulator. We have inputted all of our common topologies that are used within what we see as silicon carbide, ranging from soft switches to hard switches to single switches to flybacks to full bridges to six packs. And then you put in either your, your heat sink in your clamp it or you put in your RTH, choosing the devices and then, pre and then simulate duty cycles, input, output, and it basically gives you the waveforms, the power dissipations, and the theoretical junction temperatures. It is an excellent tool. Even I can use it, so it's pretty straightforward, but it gives you a huge amount of, uh, of results and data. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question here says, uh, what is a typical SICK MOSFET uh, DVDT? It depends on on generation, and of course, I can't comment for our our the competitors' products. But we typically would see anywhere from twenty to fifty to sixty volts per nanosecond. We are rated higher than that. But um, if you're going at above 100 volts per nanosecond, that is incredibly fast. I can't really think of that much of a uh, an application that would use it, and that would be starting to violate some data sheets. So really typically, and I showed you some examples earlier on, you'd see very commonly anywhere from 20 to 50 volts per nanosecond. All right. Thank, thank you, Guy. Uh, we've got another question here that's coming in. Uh, some of the data sheets show zero reverse recovery current, although the reverse recovery time is 29 nanoseconds. Does it mean that the reverse recovery loss is negligible? Yes. I mean, it's a little bit of poetic license there from all silicon carbide supplies. There is, of course, some sort of recovery. It's, it's the law of physics. But compared to, silic compared to, to, compared to silicon, we say zero because we're, what, 10,000 times less. So we, there still is some reverse recovery. You still have to take that into account, whether it's a dead time, whether it's power loss, but it's 10,000 times less than what you would see in silicon as a comparable body diet. All right. Thank you, Guy. And just as a note to our audience, we're going to stick around for a couple extra minutes here. Uh, we've got so many questions coming in. And... Uh, so we're going to try and answer as many as we can by taking a few extra minutes. So we're going to move on now to another question. Uh, so with uh, silicon carbide, you can use the body diode and don't need to add one between the gate and the drain? You absolutely, you know, every MOSFET comes with an inherent PN junction inside it. Now, it does have a compromise in performance versus putting a separate body diode in parallel. With silicon carbide, you absolutely get that tremendous reverse recovery from a body diode. What you will find, though, is its VF, like any body diode, will be higher than a separate shot key. So you have two options. You can either use a silicon carbide shot key diode in parallel to your device, or you can use actually use the MOSFET body diode itself. All right. Thank you, sir. Another question here says, what is the max switching frequency achievable by SICK trans, in your opinion? 
It depends very heavily on application, on how you're going to use it, and on the EMI. We've shown that the theoretical um, switching frequencies can be up to up to megahertz. We have seen people and applications use silicon carbide power devices at, at megahertz. Realistically, as you'll see from most of our designs that we show from our web pages, hard switched, we're below 100 kilohertz, which doesn't sound particularly fast compared to silicon, but we absolutely achieve it with much lower switching loss than silicon. When we go to soft switching, again, with those practical limitations of cooling and inductors and magnetics, anywhere from 400, 200 to 400 to 600 kilohertz tends to be the usable switching frequency, although you can go much higher if you can work around it. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question here says, can you cover... Uh the design of the DSAT for uh, SIC MOSFETs? I can and I will in the third webinar in detail. That's quite a lengthy uh, question to answer properly, and that's why we will absolutely be covering it in the August seminar on, on gate driving for silicon carbide. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question here asks, can I ever get away with negative voltage gate driving? Or excuse me, can I ever can you, get away without negative voltage gate driving? My apologies. Yes, you can. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, you can. We do recommend it to be uh, fully turned off, and we do recommend it for safety because if you have any noise or bounce or DV by DT sh induced shoot through, then obviously you don't want that gate coming up above zero volts and accidentally spuriously turning on any device. So taking it negative by a few volts absolutely guarantees, but we do show on our application notes working at zero volts, particularly in soft switching, is perfectly acceptable. All right, Guy, we're going to try and sneak one or two more in here. Uh, this one says, uh, for the 600-volt market, uh, there is an overlap between GAN and silicon carbide. So what are the pros and cons of silicon carbide versus GAN uh, for the 600-volt application? Oh, great question to, to finish off with. One, I need about 17 answers to, to, to hours to answer. But in theory, and very quickly, <laughs> both are fantastic technologies. Both are wide band gaps, so they have great performance advantages over silicon. We actually do a lot of GAN, but we put it on silicon carbide and for RF. So we are very experienced in GAN. What we perceive and what we are driving is that GAN is very, very good for lower voltage, as in 200 volts and below, or if it does go up to 600 volts, we tend to see it work potentially very well in very high, very low current applications like uh, cell phone chargers or tablet chargers, but it is current and voltage limited um, due to its technology, whereas really silicon carbide wakes up at 600 volts and 10 amps and goes all the way to 1,000 amps. So both work very well, but they have their specific areas where they, where they excel in. GAN being low voltage, low power, silicon carbide really being at the top end of 600 volts and above, and many amps and above. So they really are quite complementary in their uh, technologies and their positionings rather than con conflicting and competing. All right. Well, thank you, Guy. That is all the time that we have for questions for today. Once again, if we did not get to your questions, someone will get back to you after the program is over. And for more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links available in the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Once again, we'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, A Designer's Guide to Silicon Carbide Power, brought to you by Tech Online and Wolfspeed, a Cree company, also Arrow. This webinar is copyright 2020 by Aspen Core. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright by Tech Online, Wolfspeed, a Cree company, and Arrow, and the individual speakers, or individual speaker, I should say, is solely responsible for his content and opinions. On behalf of our guest and Wolfspeed, a Cree company, Arrow, I'm Chris Keach. We'd like to thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.